Human negligence and greed can cause the most horrific events in history. Due to the fault of the management trying to catch up with the backlog, a Japanese man named Aochai Hisashi and a colleague at work in experience made a terrible mistake in one of the uranium processing plants, which led to a nuclear accident that exposed him to deadly radiation about 20,000 times higher than the permissible annual rate for ordinary people. But miraculously, Aochai survived and spent 83 days in a hospital room for fatal patients. He was literally one step closer to death. His body was collapsing with each passing day, which made him feel terrible, endless pain. But he could breathe and even talk, although he kept saying that he wanted to die faster to end this torment. Our story begins in Japan on September 30, 1999. An ordinary man named Aochai Hisashi worked as a laboratory assistant for the JCO company, which makes nuclear fuel, and he is located in a village named Takemura. Takemura is a village located in the Naka district. The area of the village is 37.48 km. The population is 38,000 people. Takemura was famous for its uranium processing plant, which was later used as fuel for Japan's nuclear power plants. But the fact is that this company was sometimes engaged in processing uranium using chemical resources more than standard, in order to complete the task faster than the deadline, which required great care of employees. Since the plant did not belong to the leading enterprises of the nuclear fuel cycle in Japan, this violation did not attract much attention from regulatory organizations. The state inspector visited the plant only two times a year, and this happened only during periods when the plant was idle. Usually, the plant was engaged in processing a small amount of uranium. But on September 30, 1999 the plant began processing large quantities of uranium for the first time in three years. The three workers who took it up, including Aochai Hisashi, did not have much experience and had little idea of the processes going on in it. Aochai handled the radioactive materials in accordance with the company's instructions. The task was to enrich the uranium with a bucket. He was never told about the possibility of criticality. His colleague was pouring a solution of uranium, and Aochai was holding a funnel in his right hand. As a result, at 10.45 they loaded seven buckets of uranium nitrate into the sump, almost seven times the maximum amount allowed by the instructions. Hisashi's colleague who was adding a seventh bucket of uranium nitrate to the sump and was partially hanging over it, saw a blue flash. And Hisashi himself, who was holding the funnel nearby, immediately experienced pain, nausea, difficulty breathing and other symptoms. After a few minutes in the room he vomited and lost consciousness. There was no explosion, but the result of a nuclear reaction was intense gamma and neutron radiation from the sump, which triggered an alarm, after which actions began to localize the accident. 161 people were evacuated from 39 residential buildings within a radius of 350 meters from the plant, and they were allowed to return to their homes in two days. 11 hours after the start of the accident, a gamma radiation level of about 1,000 times higher than the natural radiation background was recorded at one of the sites outside the plant. The chain reaction continued intermittently for 20 hours, after which it stopped. Three workers, Aochai Hisashi, Masato Shinohara, and Yutaka Yakakawa who were directly working with the solution, were severely irradiated. Two other than Aochai immediately died quickly because they received 3 to 10 sieverts of radiation dose, with 5 sieverts being fatal. But Aochai Hisashi received 17 sieverts of radiation dose, 100% serious burn, but survived and was taken to the nearest hospital, where doctors worked who have many years of experience, but have never encountered patients who have such large amounts of radiation. For the sake of clarity, Aochai Hisashi was exposed to radiation that is approximately 20,000 times higher than the permissible annual norm for ordinary people. Dr. Mikawa who specialized in emergency medicine, first heard about the accident early that morning. When he was watching the TV news, he noticed that NERS employees were wearing protective suits and masks, therefore he suspected that the degree of contamination could be quite high. Due to the intense radiation exposure, Aochai was transferred to the University of Tokyo Hospital to receive state-of-the-art treatment. Dr. Mikawa became the leader of the medical team due to his central role in the professional radiation emergency medicine group. The patient who was exposed to radiation turned out to be quite different from what the nurses imagined. Aochai's right arm, which was exposed to the most radiation at the beginning, was only slightly reddened and swollen. The radiation penetrated the chromosomes of his cells. Chromosomes are blueprints of the human body that contain all the genetic information. Each pair of chromosomes has its own number and can be arranged in order. However, it was impossible to sequence the irradiated Aochai chromosomes. They were broken apart, and some of them were stuck together. The destruction of the chromosomes meant that no new cells would be generated after that. 
The first abnormal symptom caused by the destruction of chromosomes appeared in his blood cells. The number of his white blood cells which acted as the body's defense mechanism decreased dramatically. Since Auchai's white blood cell count dropped to 10% of normal, he was transferred to an isolated ward with maximum sterility. The main priority of the doctors was to restore his body's ability to produce new cells as without this it would have been impossible to save his life. An experimental operation to transplant stem cells from a healthy donor could help with this. Once these cells are introduced into the body, they grow into the patient's bone marrow and replace the damaged ones, which helps the bone marrow produce healthy cells. Fortunately, the search for a donor was quick, as Auchai's sister's stem cells fit perfectly with his body. The effect of the transplant could be seen only 10 days after the operation. Knowing that the chances of success were slim and that the family would hold out hope to the last, Dr. Miyakawa who was responsible for Aochai's treatment, allowed his family to see him every day. Miyakawa hoped that if they watched Aochai's condition gradually worsen, they would be able to accept reality. Aochai himself was not aware of his position. He asked the doctors when they would be able to discharge him and if he might develop leukemia from radiation. The supply of healthy cells in Aochai's body ran out. His skin became dry and literally fell off his body. Fluid began to build up in his lungs, and at times he found it difficult to breathe. But seeing the love and care with which Auchai communicated with his wife, the doctors decided not to install an artificial respiration machine for him. However, the very next day after meeting his wife, Auchai could not breathe on his own, and he was put on a ventilator. Despite the rapid deterioration of Auchai's condition, the family continued to visit him every day. And each time they made a paper crane in the hope that it could fulfill their wish for a speedy recovery. Although this could lead to infection, they left the cranes at Auchai's bedside to give the patient strength. Ten days after the stem cell transplant, doctors took tests again and saw that Auchai's sister's cells had taken root in his body. He became the first person in the world to receive such treatment. The number of white blood cells in his body increased, and the risk of infection rapidly decreased. But after a few days, Auchai's skin began to die off again. Moreover, his intestinal mucosa had atrophied and his body could no longer retain fluids and nutrients. Ao Chai became hostile to medical professionals, and in his medical notes he wrote touching words like, I can't stand this, stop it, mom, and so on. He experienced severe abdominal pain, as three liters of liquid stool came out of him every day. Internal bleeding began and Ao Chai received transfusions every day. On some days he received 10 transfusions per day. Trying to understand the cause of what was happening, doctors examined Ao Chai's DNA and it turned out that his chromosomes were again damaged and deformed. His body absorbed so much radiation that even without a radiation source his body would damage healthy cells on its own. Doctors tried to ease Auchai's condition with various medications, but because of the bleeding and diarrhea they simply did not stay in his body long enough to have any effect. At a certain point, his skin died to such an extent that his body began to lose 10 liters of biological fluid and they had to be replaced by intravenous medication. Trying to preserve what little skin Auchai had left, the medical team wrapped most of his body in gauze, but it soaked in blood and fluids in just a few hours, and each change of gauze caused acute pain. His eyelids were also dead and falling off, and his eyes were drying and bleeding. Dr. Miyakawa explained the situation to Auchai's family, saying that his condition is not only unlikely to improve, but may even get worse. Relatives begged the doctor to do everything in his power to save the patient's life. The last measure that could help Auchai was a large-scale transplant of artificially grown skin. Miyakawa hoped that if it took root, it would help the body retain fluid and give doctors time to find a cure. However, the amount of blood and body fluids coming out of Auchai's entire body was so large that the transplanted skin quickly fell off. By this point the entire medical team knew that he would not survive, but no one dared to say it out loud. It's been two months since Auchai was hospitalized. His skin was rotten and dead. He was breathing on a ventilator. He couldn't close his eyes because he had no eyelids. Blood and liquid were flowing out all over the area of his body. He was in constant agony, but he was alive. Constant blood loss and transfusions caused his heart rate to increase to a steady 120 beats per minute, as if he was running a marathon. The strain on Auchai's heart was incredible, and on November 27, it stopped. Since the medics did not receive a ban on resuscitation, they were legally obliged to bring Auchai back to life. After three repeated stops, his pulse recovered, but it was just as fast. These seizures led to oxygen starvation of the brain and a gradual deterioration in brain activity. His life was completely dependent on medical equipment, and he no longer reacted to the words of his relatives. Although the family did not lose hope, Auchai's immune cells began to attack the healthy white blood cells. 
and very soon they completely disappeared. In this state, even a simple cold could kill him in a few hours. On the 81st night of Auchai's stay in the hospital, Dr. Miyakawa gathered his relatives and told them that he could not be saved and that if he had a second attack, he should not be resuscitated. Auchai's family agreed and signed a waiver for resuscitation, hoping that he wouldn't have to suffer anymore. On day 83 his wife and son visited Auchai for the last time. That same night, his heart stopped beating. It is easy to think that Auchai's life was kept alive against his will. Many on the internet argue that he begged for death, that doctors kept him alive only to test new treatments. But do not forget that the doctors used all the means available at that time to save Auchai's life at the request of his family. According to an April 2000 report by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, an investigation by the Japanese government found that the main causes of the accident were insufficient regulatory oversight, a lack of proper safety culture, and insufficient training and qualifications of employees. Six JCO officials were charged with professional negligence and violating nuclear safety laws. In 2003, the court gave them suspended prison sentence, and the company and at least one of the officials were fined. What do you think about this story? Did the doctors do everything right? Or should they be condemned for this? Write it in the comments and subscribe to this channel to hear many such interesting stories related to the anomaly and crime. Thank you all. Bye.